Many of the state exhibits, we are unhappy to report, are on the dull and unimaginative side. They seem to be a collection of afterthoughts and the obvious, the work of governor's relatives. I liked Florida because it made no pretense of being architecture. It reminded me of a Florida resort, garish, sprawling, and possessing a few square feet of sandy beach scattered over which are bathing beauties. Come on down. Inside the pavilion, there is an example of the expensive good taste that may also be found in Florida. A number of Floridians lent paintings from their collections. Among them is a magnificent Franz Hals. There is also a biblical scene, Lot and his family leaving Sodom by Peter Paul Rubens. And a superb Cezanne, the artist's portrait of his son. The paintings are a splendid surprise and may be seen free. The Florida Pavilion's Porpoise Show has an admission charge. As it happens, neither free paintings nor professional porpoises have made the Florida Show a resounding success, and there has been talk of its closing. They call this the Bridge of Size. It leads from the fair proper to the amusement area. By now, most people are aware that the amusement area has been something of a pocket of poverty. To beef up the sparse attendance in the amusement zone, an altitudinous team of acrobats, the nerveless Knox, perform daily free of charge. The Knox are a fine act, but the crowds remain marginal, and the shows, rides, and exhibits in the area are still suffering. few mild rides in the amusement area. What is lacking is a gaudy midway atmosphere. One longs for an exhilarating loop-the-loop -loop or cyclone or whip. A little bit of Coney Island seems to be needed, but instead of cotton candy, there's a shiny new monorail, which charges 80 cents for an eight-minute ride. It's a slow, stately ride in accord with the ground it covers. Nobody has come up with any elephant jokes about the One Ring Circus at the fair. We're told it's an excellent circus, but it has done far from capacity business. Some observations may be in order as to why the amusements are neglected. For one thing, they're geographically isolated from the rest of the fair and are hard to reach. For another, people are reluctant to pay the high prices for entertainment when there's so much that's free in the industrial areas. Finally, the amusements themselves are simply not good enough or unusual enough to arouse a heavy public response. There are no big name entertainers. Many of the major productions are routine and uninspired. And Robert Moses, the president of the fair, has vetoed anything suggesting sex. Many exhibitors are longing for a bit of Sally Rand to draw the customers. One looks back with longing to the 1939 World's Fair when Bill Bojangles Robinson delighted packed houses every night with the hot Mikado. There's nothing approaching that high level of entertainment at the 64 fair, and it's a shame. One enterprise in the amusement area that's doing very nicely is the log flume ride. The logs are made of fiberglass from the mighty fiberglass forests of North America, 
and the price is 95 cents for a three minute ride or 32 cents a minute. It's recommended that you take your aunt along on this diversion, in which event the ride may be referred to as La Flume de Matant. The climax is a slide down the last chute, which looks as though it would soak you through but actually sends you away only slightly moist and hardly needing a pressing. <laughs> Among the industrial exhibitors at the fair, the computer looms large. International Business Machines has hired Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson to explain how computers work. It's an animated puppet show in the IBM arcade. There is no waiting and the performance is continuous. I found it delightful. Several cuts above some of the more elaborate efforts by the big corporations. It also taught me something about computers. Holmes, a most astounding affair. The Paddington Bob has stolen the Glasgow Express. So that's why it's late. Oh, according to London Switchman, helpful fellow with olive moustache, train left London on time, heading east towards us at full throttle. Of course, it never got here. Switchman at wicket, amusing green moustached fellow, reports train had not passed there either. I say, Holmes, are you taking notes? No, just checking over my monograph on Boolean two-valued logic, as used in computing machines. I do wish you'd pay more attention to the matter at hand. Pray continue. The switchman at Babbage on time, droll chap wearing a mossy handlebar, says train did come from Wicket, went on north towards Glasgow, but Scotland Yard can't find any trace of it north of Babbage. Uh, that seems to be it, Holmes. Seen in London and in Babbage, but nowhere else. we better move quickly. We still have a few minutes before we apprehend them. Dash it all, Holmes. How could you possibly know that? Scotland Yard is mystified. That, Watson, is because Scotland Yard thinks as you do. Oh, I suppose you think me simple-minded. Not simple-minded enough, Watson. Now look at this problem as a series of simple true or false statements. Holmes, this isn't catching us any railroad bandits. On the contrary, true or false, on or off, is or isn't right or wrong, this two-sided logic can solve crimes, and a crime solved is a criminal court. By the by, Watson, turn that railroad switch, will you? I say, that leads onto a dead-end track. Quite. disguising themselves as the southbound express. Incredible, Holmes, but how on earth... Well, my dear you... fellow, it is a simple exercise in two-valued logic. Now let us attack the problem in much the same way as one would program for an electric computer. What are the facts? Now, was the London switchman telling the truth? Well, I know. If he had been, the train would be here. Exactly. Four possibilities remain, then. Wicket and Babbage both told the truth. No, no. If the train did not go through Wicket, it could not have reached Babbage from Wicket. Excellent reasoning, my dear Watson. Suppose Wicket were true and Babbage false. Oh, impossible. For if he truly had not seen the train, we would have. Then was Wicket false and Babbage true? Oh, no. For in that case, the train would have been seen north of Babbage. Splendid. Then there is only one remaining possibility. All three statements were false. And the express went west from London, passed through Wicket, and turned south from Babbage. Oh, fantastic, Holmes. But, but why would all three railroad men have lied? Elementary, my dear Watson. Did it not strike you that each of the three was a man with a moustache of a singular green hue? And the leader of the Paddington mob is a man with a green moustache. Correct. I suspect we shall have a visitor shortly. Throw that switch again, will you, Watson? Oh, it's incredible, Holmes. What to know? Not if you reduce the problem to simple true or false statements. <laughs> 